God, why is this happening to me? What is going on? Why is it so bad? Why do they not act right? Why is it so crazy in my life? Why are all these things in the middle of this storm, whatever that storm is in your life, why is all that going on in my life? Jesus knows every storm. And sometimes he brings storms and allows storms to come into your life to get you out of the boat. But these guys, in the middle of the darkest moments, the storm was raging around them. They began to cry out in, in fear. They began to just say, you know what, we, we are going to drown in the middle of this thing. And that is how some of you are. You are right up to here. You are at the end of your rope. The boat is filling up and you're wondering to yourself, is there any hope? For my life, for my marriage, for my relationships, for my kids, for all of this stuff in life. Is there any hope at, at all? And these guys were crying out in fear. You know, the safest place on that day, it wasn't in the boat. It was actually out of the boat. You say, I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't agree with you. Where, where was Jesus? Jesus was out of the boat. He was walking on the water and he was above the very thing that was terrifying them. Above all of your problems and all of your issues and all of your worries and all of your doubts and all the stuff that just has your insides knotted up, Jesus is above every one of those. He walks on top of the things that are pulling us under. And the safest place is not in your comfortable lifestyle, your comfortable boat. The most safe place that you could ever be is right next to Jesus. This is amazing. Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We're in the heart of Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We look forward to you joining us in person sometime soon as we worship the Lord together. They don't just walk past it. They pick it up. There's a way that they can repurpose it. 
uh, they they will put gasoline in it to run a stove or, or you know the little burners. They'll put gasoline in it to put in a motorcycle to help somebody out. They put oil in it to help cook rice and beans. They throw nothing away. They will find a way to repurpose. We are just such a wasteful society. I, you know, I used to think that I needed a, a nice house in a nice neighborhood and I needed a new car and that was what you had to have here to be successful in life. That is not what we have to have for success here. Uh, I would be fine living in a, in a shed now as long as I had running water and electricity. I don't mind driving my 10 year old paid off car. That's more money that I have that I can put towards others that truly, truly need it. The one thing I can say that they have here that we don't have, besides the nice luxury items, is for those people to be living in the poverty conditions that they're living in, they have joy like no one here has. That is all that they have is hope um, and, and to rely on their faith to get them through. And faith is not an easy thing for them to have there. You know, if we woke up tomorrow and we had to wonder how we were going to feed our kids, I don't know that we could all wake up and have joy and be faithful. We would wake up and cry and wallow in our own self-pity, but that's not how they are. The, the ones that are Christians firmly rely on God, but it's not easy in a society that is surrounded with um, voodoo. And the voodoo, the people that do practice voodoo there, they put a lot of pressure on the Christians. They do not like Christians because the voodoo priests lose their power over people if you're a Christian and no longer live in voodoo. So it's, an also, it's also a dangerous culture to live in if, if you're a Christian. I, I will never, ever be the same after going my first time. And now I've been three times and I'm going back for my fourth time in July. It's not something I can quit doing. It's completely in my heart now. If it's something that you've ever considered doing, it's, you don't have to necessarily go to Haiti. You can go anywhere where they need, you can go anywhere where they need help. But God's called us to help. And I don't want to die one day and wonder what have I done with my life to help other people or to do something that's made God proud of me. When I get to heaven, I want God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I want to leave a legacy for my children to want to help others and do what we're called to do. Amen. Amen. I hope y'all have a good break when goes up. I'm probably not going to get done just in time. You told me to be. You don't get done. <laughs> anyway, I'll make it as quick as possible. Um, how do you been twice to Haiti and she come home and... After a month of hearing about Haiti, I found myself, you know, good Lord, is there something we can talk about besides Haiti? I'm, I'm sick of hearing it. Um, last October, God really burdened my heart for some odd reason for, for Haiti. So I started praying about it, and like she said, we just got back. Um, and it's a place you can only understand if you go there. Um, the night before we flew out, I was trying to find every excuse in the book to go, you know, to stay home. You know, what if my dad dies? What if my dog gets run over? Just, you know, anything I could find to stay home. But that morning we went to fly out. Um, it started in the airport. We got to witness to a lady and she accepted Jesus into her heart there at the airport. And uh, I said, well, I better go and get on the plane. Something, something you know, something's bound good to happen. So we get there. And I can consider myself a pretty tough guy. I don't, I don't cry much um, or try not to, rather, especially in front of people. Um, I wasn't there 30 minutes, and from the kids walking around with no clothes or just their living conditions, um, the poorest of the poor people here are, are rich compared to those people. Um, we went over there to build a house for a gentleman, and... We, we got that house accomplished. Uh, I noticed those guys, those car, those uh, construction workers, they had ate on Monday. And on Thursday, they had not ate again. And these guys were working 12 and 14 hour days to build this house. Um, so Friday, we uh, scrounged up some money and uh, got them something to eat. But that's something we take for granted here. We know we're, you know, we know we're gonna get a meal. When we leave here, we know we're gonna go eat somewhere, go home and eat a good meal. They don't know where that comes from. Uh, Heidi took a bag of suckers, so those little dumb, dumb suckers, and to us, that's, that's nothing. I pulled one out and I ate it, and man, it looked like a stampede of just kids, like two or three hundred of them literally would come begging for one. 
And like she said, they would break it in half and give to their friend so that they'd make sure they got one. Um, God did a real work in me while I was there. Um, I, it's something I can't explain. It's you, you just have to go there. Um, and God really burdened my heart while I was there to to not only when I got back, to not forget about those people, to um, do what I can. I mean, I know there's mission work to be done here. Um, there's all over the place. But um, it's different when you see a child um, naked and, and pretty much begging for food. And then when he gets up, he, he breaks it in half to share with his, his sister or his friend. But anyway, I got to pray, and while I was there, Marcus had sent me a message one morning that was eating breakfast. And um, right then it hit me, I said, I'm going back to Haiti as soon as I get to the house. So I started praying about a team. And Marcus, you know, he told me, he said, we'll pray about it. We'll pray about it. We'll see what God does. Well, we come home that Sunday morning, and she talked about Survivor's Guild. I wanted to go check myself into a mental facility because that's how bad I felt. Um, I stopped at the store and got a candy bar and a coat. I ended up putting the candy bar back, and I would have put the coat back, and I had done open, open it up and started drinking. But the little things you feel so bad about, you know. And anyway, long story short, Marcus sent me a text back and forth with a few other guys with Blake and Dustin and a friend of mine. And I really didn't think it was going to happen as quick as it did. I, I kind of got discouraged, but I remember sitting there and I got a text or a message from Marcus that said, uh, my plane ticket's booked, what are we waiting on? So, you know, I needed that. I needed that from him. And uh, my emotional status kind of went back somewhat normal. You know, I, I was a peace of mind, so to speak. But be praying for us as we go back. Me and Marcus, Blake, Dustin, and another guy from Hattiesburg. We're going back in April. Um, we'll be doing some construction work and just sharing the gospel. I want to share just a little bit of scripture with you, and, and, and I'll shut up. But um, this scripture really hit home to me, and it speaks volumes. And it's out of the gospel of Matthew chapter 25. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you, feed, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I said to you in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Please be in prayer for our group as we go. Please be in prayer for me and Heidi as we go back in July. Um, and hopefully again towards the end of the year. This is something that's very important to me. I don't, I don't ask people to, to give or anything, but please be in prayer about how you can help our team get over there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a $2 bag of suckers is worth a million dollars over there. You know, pick up a bag of suckers and drop them off at the church. We're having some garage sales and fundraisers. Please be in prayer how you can help us there. Uh, we appreciate the time you let us come to share about Hayden with you.
do, would you stand with me in honor of the Lord and His Word as we read God's Word together as we begin this morning, Matthew chapter 14, starting verse 22. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Getting to the other side. Verse 22, immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side. While well, He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. And now when evening came, He was alone there. Verse 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Verse 26 says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were in trouble, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter came come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you of little faith. Not you of no faith, but you of little faith. Why did you die? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Father, this morning, we come to declare and worship that you are the Son of God. Our life makes no sense. Things are stormy at times. But it all boils down to you are the Son of God. And today, may you lead us to the other side, wherever that might be in our lives. May we not be content with where we are. Lead us to the other side, I ask in Jesus' name. Go ahead and be seated. As you're seated, a long, long time ago, I was 16 years old. Long time ago. Really long time ago. At least you remember that? Long, long time ago. My older sister there, she, she remembers that a lot better than I do. But 16, when I was 16 years old, I, I, I learned how to drive a standard. Because my daddy said, you know what, if you're going to learn how to drive a car, you're going to learn how to drive a stick shift, right? And, and you may know what I'm talking about. So, so, you know, I learned how to drive on that. But the stick shift on that day was not available. So when I went to get my license as a 16-year-old kid, uh, daddy decided, you know what you're going to do? You're going to take it in the van that we've got outside. It wasn't a minivan. No, 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 no. no. It, it, it was the custom velour padded seats with the little buttons on the side. It had running lights down the middle of that bad board. It had a table that you could take out. It had little cup holders in the middle of that table. So my daddy decided, you know what? You're 16 years old. Why don't you take the big van to get your driver's license test? You ever done a three-point turn in a van that you can't even see in Africa behind you? I mean, this was like, this was the van of all vans. And so here I am, I'm trying to turn around, do a three-point turn. It did not work very well. In fact, when I tried to do my three-point turn, I put it in reverse, what I thought was reverse. I started putting all the gas, and I was like, man, this, this thing does not want to move. Well, there's a difference between reverse and neutral, and it doesn't work in neutral. And so here I am, boy, I was just as nervous as could be. I am a licensed driver now, and so uh, I know many of you are very proud of that. But there I was. I, I learned how to get my license in that thing. Well, not much longer after I got my license in that big old van, I was driving down this road, and I used to live in a place called Tornado Alley. And once I, as a 16-year-old kid, driving on the road, I began to notice, you know what? It's cloudy outside. I can do this. I'm a grown man. 16. Hey, you know what? I'm beginning to feel a little bit of wind beginning to blow a little bit more. I can do this. I can get on home. I can get to the other side. Why? Because it's not that bad. But then all of a sudden, it got even darker, and hail started falling down on top of my car. And I'm like, you know what? There, there is... There's something happening here. And as I look ahead of me, I see this thing that's kind of shaped like, an up, like a V. And I'm looking, it's about you know, a couple miles. I'm not really good at how many miles away it was. But it was close enough to where I could see it. And I could see things beginning to spin around it. And I'm thinking, you know what? I have a, a crossroads decision to make here. Do I head towards this tornado that is right there? Or do I turn right and head back home? As all smart 16-year-olds would do, guess what I did? I went, no, I went home. <laughs> so, so I went home. I, I knew. I got my driver's license in that big old van. It was time to turn at this crossroads and get all the way back home. I, I tried to drive a little bit, but I was deciding, you know what? It, it's time. I realized I need to get home. No matter how far I drove into it, I needed to turn around. And then... And then I, I grew and time changed and 
that as time began to change, I got to, the, to a, a ripe old age of 20-something where I had my first baby. And so, so here it is, Hannah was born. But you know what happens when you have a child? Your driving changes a little bit. Uh, and the things that you have to do to get ready for you, you know, you have grandkids that you haul around, it, it changes a lot. In fact, we were the kind of parents who, who would take your arm. I know some of y'all grew up like this, where your seatbelt was the arm. You, you know, anybody like grew up like that? You know, so, so I know some of y'all, that was your seatbelt. No, no, we were those modern parents who all of a sudden we would take the babies and we would get the 12 point harness and we'd make sure that, you know what, it had to be tight in there according to the specifications of the, you know, uh, of the state trooper. We made sure that this baby was strapped. That buckle that he had everything in place. And parents like that, uh, they would just drive you crazy when they're in the front seat, they ain't buckled up. And so, you know, here I was, we, we buckled all in. Why, why would I go through all that trouble when as a 16 year old I didn't even worry about a seatbelt or anything else? Tornadoes didn't really bother me too much until they were real close. But why did I change my mind when I had a couple little ones? Because we used to have this sign that says precious cargo on bull. And so to get to the other side, we knew for sure that we had precious cargo on board. To get to the other side of where we needed to go, we had precious cargo on, on board. So we took care of that crossroads. We took care of that baby. We took care of whatever way we had to do in order to get to the other side. You begin to look at this experience that Peter and the disciples had on that boat, and we realized that they were at a crossroads there, and there was inside of that little boat with these 12 disciples, there was precious cargo on board. And so I want to give you just three quick things, just three quick crossroads as we go through a series of, of times in your life where you face a crossroads experience, a time where you have to make a decision, three quick crossroads, and you'll notice in your bulletin that these are very short, quick words that you'll see on your app as well. The first one is, is that you have a crossroads between either staying in or getting out. In or out. That is the first crossroads that I look as we look at this passage of scripture that they experience. In fact, if you begin to look at verse 28, it says, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you out on the water. And Jesus said, verse 29, he said, come. When Peter come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. You see, in your life right now, Heidi kind of alluded to this, they were quite comfortable. Before you ever went to Heidi, you were comfortable in your boat there. I try to tell Heidi and, 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 um, and Gerald that when they get married, that Bogalusa, you know what, you go to Haiti, girl, not much different Bogalusa, you know, you, you kind of weigh your options there. And so, you know, so I was trying to tell them, hey, you know, you need to come and invest your life in the great city of Bogalusa. You can love Jesus here in Bogalusa. But before she went to, to Haiti, she was very comfortable there in Petal, Mississippi. I mean, they got a Walmart down in Petal, Mississippi. They got a lot of things there. They got a baseball team. They got, they got a lot of stuff going on there in Petal, Mississippi. Comfortable, nice, beautiful little place, little home environment. I mean, you know, it's like Bayberry. Folks are just singing Kumbaya on the streets of Hattiesburg, you know, Petal, Mississippi. Isn't that right? Y'all from Hattiesburg, well, isn't that right? Just this Kumbaya all the time. So all of a sudden, here they are, and it's very safe. Your life, even though you may not be going to Haiti, your life is very comfortable. I like my recliner. I like my house. I like the things exactly the way they are. I don't want to get out of the boat. And here's the thing. Jesus knows our tendency to get very comfortable exactly where we are to where we might not even want to worry about getting to the other side. The other side of what? The other side of growing in your relationship to Christ. The other side of growing closer to Him. The other side of Him using your life. The other side of just seeing His blessing pour out on you. He knows we get very comfortable that we are not the kind of people who want to be uncomfortable. And so what does He do? He says, go out in the boat. Did you notice when He went out to the boat, these disciples were there, that Jesus knew that there was a storm that was coming. You know what? You may be surprised at your storm sometimes. God, why is this happening to me? What is going on? Why is it so bad? Why do they not act right? Why is it so crazy in my life? Why are all these things in the middle of this storm, whatever that storm is in your life, why is all that going on in my life? Jesus knows every storm. And sometimes he brings storms that allow storms to come into your life to get you out of the boat. But these guys, in the middle of the darkest moment, the storm was raging around them. They began to cry out in, in fear. He began to just say, you know what, we, we are going to drown in the middle of this thing. And that is how some of you are. You are right up to here. You are at the end of your rope. The boat is filling up and you're wondering to yourself, is there any hope for my life, for my marriage, for my relationships, for my kids, for all of this stuff in life? Is there any hope at, at 
No, these guys were crying out in fear. You know, the safest place on that day, it wasn't in the boat, it was actually out of the boat. You say, I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't agree with you. Where, where was Jesus? Jesus was out of the boat. He was walking on the water, and he was above the very thing that was terrifying them. Above all of your problems, and all of your issues, and all of your worries, and all of your doubts, and all the stuff that just has your insides knotted up, Jesus is above every one of those. He walks on top of the things that are pulling us under. And the safest place is not in your comfortable lifestyle, your comfortable boat. The most safe place that you could ever be is right next to Jesus. He wanted to get out of the boat so that he could get in the water so that he could be right there with Jesus. Now, I know some of you are thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm not really sure if you understand my lifestyle, preacher. Can I tell you? Some of you would rather be in a boat surrounded by 12 stinky fishermen instead of getting out of the boat and being next to Jesus. Can, can you imagine what this boat would have been like? Twelve dudes been working all day, been walking dusty as can be, and these dudes are all in this boat. You got Thomas who is down, you got Peter who keeps on talking about everybody, you got John and James who want to get right next to him, so you know what, man, look at me, I'm all, you know. You got all these dudes in the middle of this, I guarantee you. In the middle of your life, you are surrounded by a lot of voices and people. And you think to yourself, you know what? It is more comfortable inside of this boat. No, the safest place, the greatest place that you can ever be is out of the boat. If you stay in the boat, you will never experience the miracle of walking out on the water. And Jesus has not called you to just stay where you are. He wants you to get out of the boat and get right to where he is. You see, we often talk about the fact that he drowned. Uh, no, 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 no. The bigger thing is that he actually got out of the boat. Can I tell you? For some of you, it is time to make a decision. Do I either stay in where I am, in my misery, in my depression, in the way that my relationships are going, in the things that I'm experiencing in life, in all this turmoil and strife, or do I get out and say, I'm going to go where, wherever Jesus is. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Wherever Jesus takes me, that's where I want to be. Right beside Jesus is the safest place that I could ever be. You have to come to a crossroads in your life to say, you know what? I'm going to trust Jesus with my life. I'm going to get out of this boat, out of this pew, out of the circumstances, out of the situation that I'm in. I'm just going to, to trust Jesus. Are you going to be, is you in or is you out? You know, some, some of y'all may remember that from back in the day. Is you going to be in or are you going to just go out and say, I'm going to be right next, next to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him. Over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to just trust him even more. Some of you, some, some of you, I, I, I have a hard time getting you just get out of the pew and just say, you know what, I'm going to serve and love Jesus. I'm going to trust him there. So I know in your own life it might even be a little bit more difficult than that. But listen to me, friends. The best place in your life is not in the boat of your circumstances, your issues, your problems, and all that stuff. You have been through enough storms in your life to last forever. It is no longer time for you to just sit there in your boat of comfort that you think is the best way to live. No, friends, some of us need to get, get on up out of the boat. And he yeah. hears our cry. Uh, let, let me move on real quick. It's not only in or out, but it's up or down. Did you notice verse 29 that all of a sudden Jesus says to him, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He, he just walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw, verse 30, that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, Save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you little faith, why did you die? You come today to a crossroads of down or up. You say, I'm not really sure what, what you mean. The crossroads down is, is that he looked down and he began to sink. Why? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to, to look down. Some of you are making the decision over and over again every single day of your life to just look down. Look down at your circumstances. Look down at people who are dragging you down. Look down at all the stuff that's going on in your life. You're just looking down. You take your eyes off of Jesus and you are just looking down. And there are so many believers in Christ who are living just sinking day after day after day. They are sinking in their sin, sinking in their worry, sinking in their doubt. They're just 
sinking to where they just cannot breathe. They're just wondering to yourself, why is life like this? Why do I keep on going through stuff? Why am I just sinking? Well, friends, you have a crossroads to make. Do I continue to go down? Downhill, down away from the Lord, down on all this stuff, down things I'm going through. Do I continue to go down, 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 or do I make a decision that I'm going to start going up, 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 up with, with Jesus? Did you notice that he, as he was beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Did you notice it didn't say he was sinking? You see, I, I've jumped in a pool. I swam in the, swam in the ocean. I, I, I've, I've been to bodies of water. When I'm jumping in, there's not a whole lot of time for me to just say, Lord, save me. Because why? Because I'm already straight down underneath the water by that time. It doesn't say that he sank. It says as he was beginning to sink, then he, he cried out to Jesus. You know what? The very fact that you're here today means that you ain't sunk yet. The very fact that, that you got up this morning and you said, you know what, uh, I ain't going to put a bullet in my head. I'm not going to end my life today. The very fact that, that God gave me a breath when I woke up this morning and air filled my lungs. The very fact that you are here today. You've made it through all of the storms and all of the stuff and all of the things that you are going through right now that you've been through, that you've experienced all your life. The very fact that you are here means that you have not sunk. Now, you still could be sinking. But in the middle of those times of sinking, you have a choice to make. Do I just continue to go downhill? Do I just continue to go through the mess that I'm going through? Do I just continue to live the way that I'm living? Or do I, in the middle of sinking sand, just begin to just, just cry out? Oh, he didn't have to say, Lord, I am a sinner who has messed up. And, and I am someone who is unworthy of all that. He, he didn't have to come up with a speech to try to get Jesus to rescue him. He didn't have to say, Lord, I promise you that this time, if you get me out of this mess, then Lord, I'll, I'll do better. I'll come to church more. I'll, I'll give. I'll do whatever you want me to do. No, he didn't. He didn't have time for that. And he didn't say, you know what, Lord, 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 Lord I'm going to commit my life. I'm, I'm going to go to Haiti. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to go to that place. No, 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 he didn't say all that. You know all he had an opportunity to do in the middle of him just sinking down? He didn't try to get spiritual. He didn't try to get theological. He didn't try to come up with some great excuse or some big words. He said three words in the middle of him, sinking from the top to the bottom. He just simply cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. In the middle of your times of sinking, quit trying to explain to God all that you need and all that you want. Sometimes in the middle of sinking, all you can do is just say, Lord, save me. I am drowning. I am falling. I am, I am just going down. And all you can do is just, just reach out your, your hand and say, Lord, I'm tired of going down. Lord, just, just raise, raise me up. He just simply says, Lord, save me. The guys in the boat couldn't do it. They was in a big mess as it was anyway. Everybody else around him couldn't do it. It was just, just Jesus. Just Jesus who stretched out his hand. Just Jesus who caught him. Just Jesus who did so immediately. Jesus didn't look and say, hey guys, look at Peter. Look at how he's drowning. Can you believe somebody could do that? He didn't say, you know what, boy, I wish some of you guys were going to know. He just reached down immediately and, and picked him up. Some of you are so down as believers in Jesus. You are so down in regret and shame and condemnation and, and you came in here with more burdens on your back and on your shoulders and in your stomach and in your stress and in your marriage and all this stuff that is just weighing you down and, and you just live down and get beat down and tore down and just living down. But some of you need to say today, Lord, I ain't sunk yet. I may be sinking, but I ain't down yet. The, the ten count ain't quite arrived. And Lord, I'm just going to say, Lord, Lord, save me. Am I a sinner? Absolutely. Lord, save me. Have I messed up? Absolutely. Lord, save me. I just say, I'm tired of going down. I make a decision at this crossroads of my life to, to go up. Peter often struggled with being down, lived in regret and condemnation. But, but here's the whole reason why, why this whole event happened, and it's the last part there. Verse 32, Jesus reached down and grabbed him up. Verse 32 says, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. You will make a decision today. 
that you will either bow or you will break. You will either bow or you will break. The storm will come. Amen or oh me. The storms come. It could be relationship storms, health storms, it could be issue storms, it could be all kinds of storms. Storms will come into your life. Now the question is, are you going to be in the middle of the boat or are you going to be right there in the very hands of Jesus? Are you going to keep going through stuff by yourself with no answer and no clue to solve it, to fix it, to get over it? Or are you just going to bow down before the Lord? Life storms, you will either get to your knees and bow down before the king, the lord, the master of the sea, or he will break you to where you have nothing else except that you are just broken before him. You will bow down or you will break down. Some of you are, ooh, you are right at the verge of a breakdown. You have been sinking down. You have been doing everything on your own strength. You've been trying to fix it and solve it and do all these things all on your own. And you gave it one more thing happens in your life. You're going to break down. Why wait to break down when you can just simply bow down before the, the king, before the Lord? Life crashes in. Life, life hurts sometimes, but, but you need to bow down. You see, these men right here, when they saw Jesus, and they saw what Jesus could do to one person who would just say, Lord, I'm willing to come. When they did that, what did they do? They did one thing. They said, I'm going to bow down. I'm going to worship. And I'm going to declare that truly you are the Son of God. Today, we are in a boat. We're in a boat. I don't know what your boat is. I don't know what you are confined in. For some of you, it's that, you know what? You have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You are trapped in a boat of sin. And if you keep on going that road that you're taking, you keep on sailing along that river, you keep on going that way, friends, you will be broken in the very end. Why? Because living a life without Jesus Christ is not life at all. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He gives life and gives it to you more abundantly. And so you are wasting your life if you never give your life to Jesus. I would rather be out on the stormy water, sinking there and having Jesus hold my hand than being in a boat by myself, alone or surrounded by 12 stinky folks who have no clue what is going on, who can't give me any direction or help because they are nothing else but there alone for the ride. I don't need to live my life alone for the ride. I need to live my life right next to Jesus. And I'd rather bow down before him than let life just break me into pieces. And so as you have a decision to make, you're at a crossroads. Do I go up or do I keep going down? Am I going to stay in or am I going to get out and be with Jesus? Am I going to bow or am I going to, to break? So Gerald didn't tell you that when he contacted me, it was 12.30 in the morning on a Sunday. I don't work but Sunday and Wednesday, bro. And so here he is, he's calling me that, that early in the morning, messaging me. And so the Lord just, you know what? The Lord's like, Marcus, that grown man's crying. I don't want to hear that. I ain't got no time to go to no Haiti. I've been to Africa. I, I know what Bogalus is like. I ain't got no time to go to no Haiti. Boy, you gonna get in? Or you gonna get out? But Lord, you know what? But, but, but you don't understand that I got stuff down here I got to take care of. And, and you don't know my, you know, you don't know my finances, my savings, and my checking account, the way that they kind of separated and stuff. You know, <laughs> Blake got that one. None of y'all ever, you know. Y'all saints, none of y'all understood that, but, 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 but the way it was set up, uh, but you know, I was like, no, no, I, I can't, I can't go up there, I, I got, I got, no, that don't work into my, my schedule. And that brother starts crying, he starts having a heart for Jesus, and he is my brother from another mother, he actually likes me better than his own wife, and I actually like him better than, you know, other white people, so. So it's all good. And so, uh, so he's my brother. So I began to just think to myself, you know what, Lord, what, what, what do I do? So I get online. And the tickets were like $600 cheaper than Heidi had ever seen in my life. I mean, that's $600 cheap. And then, and then I'm like, you know what, I guess I'm going to get on my app and see what's in there. Check my savings account. You know, had a little bit of money in there. So let, let me buy this ticket real quick. And 
let me message this dude real quick. And I guess in the end, I guess we're going to hate. <laughs> and then the other dudes, they're like, I guess we're going to hate you too. I mean, that happened so quick. It was just like Jesus just said, okay, bro, you go going to hate. Now, I don't know how it's going to happen. We sure hope that y'all come and spend, you know, $20 on a, a cup on this uh, garage sale. Because you're going to have to have it. <laughs> we, appreciate, you know, we appreciate that $20, you know, uh, uh, Tupperware cup that y'all about to buy. Um, but what? I could have been real comfortable inside the boat, inside the boat of my life and just trying to handle my own business. But then God says, no, I don't want you to stay where you are. I want you to come here. I want you to come, come here. Friends, I don't know what, what boat you're in, but I know God doesn't want you stuck right where you are. He wants you to come to the other side. He, he's calling you. For some of you, that may just mean he's calling you to come and take the preacher by the hand. I'll, I'll have a dry hand by that time. It's sweating right now, but by the time you get here, it'll be dry. I'm going to make sure it's dry in my pocket. And you may just need to say, I need to take the preacher by the hand and talk about my relationship with Jesus. I don't want you to do that. For some of you coming here, maybe just say, I need to come and lay something at the altar. I don't want to keep carrying that around. I'm going to get out of the pew. I'm going to come lay my life down before the Lord and take care of some things with Jesus. I don't know what the Lord is calling you to get to the other side. But wherever it is, if it's with Jesus, it's a whole lot better than where you've been. Amen. And it's time to get right next to Jesus. Would you bow your head for just a moment? Yes, thank about. you for joining us today at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We hope you'll be able to join us this coming Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or 6 o'clock in the evening time. Wednesdays at 6 o'clock for our prayer service, and we also have youth and children's activities as well. We look forward to seeing you. Hope to meet you in person here in Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We hope to see you soon.